Hello, everyone, and welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the Managing Director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum and networking platform at the intersection of finance, technology, and public policy. SALT Talks are a digital interview series with leading investors, creators, and thinkers. And our goal on these SALT Talks is the same as our goal at our SALT conferences, which we're excited to resume in September of 2021 here in our home city of New York. But our goal is to provide a window into the mind of subject matter experts, as well as provide a platform for what we think are big ideas that are shaping the future. And we're very excited to welcome Daniel Silva back to SALT Talks for his second appearance. I think Daniel is only the second guest that we've welcomed uh, for multiple appearances. So uh, we know it's worth it because he's a, one of the best authors out there today. And I know uh, Anthony is one of his biggest fans, so we're excited oh, to have you well, back. Dan- Danny, Danny, I think I'm the other guest that he's referring to. He allows me to come back on from time to time. So I, know, which, which I, think, I think it's you and me, Danny. <laughs> okay, I, I will try to, uh, well, I'll to read a little up bit to more. advance billing. <laughs> I'll read a little bit more about uh, Daniel for those who haven't tuned into the first episode we did with him or uh, read his fantastic books. But he is an award-winning, number one New York Times best-selling author, best known for his long-running thriller series starring spy and art restorer Gabrielle Alon. Uh, Silva's books are critically acclaimed bestsellers around the world and have been translated into more than 30 languages. He resides in Florida with his wife, uh, the wonderful television journalist Jamie Gangle, and uh, their twins, Lily and Nicholas. And I will say my parents are now hooked on the Gabrielle Alon series. They were not readers before uh, you joined us on Salt Talks the first time, and now they can't get enough of Gabrielle Alon. And again, hosting today's talk is Anthony Scaramucci, the founder and managing partner of Skybridge Capital, a global alternative investment firm. And like I mentioned, Anthony might be your biggest fan, Daniel. Uh, and he was very excited to get an advanced copy of your book uh, and pour through it. So uh, with no further ado, I'll let Anthony take over. Yes, I have to confess, there's nothing more delightful than not having to wait for the delivery date of the publisher, Mr. Silva. Getting it from you was fantastic, and I do appreciate it. But I got I got to flip to the back of the book here. This yeah. very handsome man. Is this Gabriel Alon, Daniel Silver? That's what I need to know. Uh, that is not Gabriel Alon. I mean, I am, um, you know, there are many authors who see themselves in their characters or imagine them their characters. I've just never been, um, you know, one of them. Um, I, I can't do the things that he can do. I would want to do the things that he can do. Um, now, does he share certain characteristics of mine? Um, yeah, lots and lots. Um, but but no, I do not imagine myself to be to Gabriel Long. He's much better looking than I am. Not you. Um, Did but, you hear that, Darcy? Me. I finally got a compliment from one of our guests. Okay? Yeah, you're one of the few. The you're one of the few guys around that that uh, that can give him a run for money in that department. All right. Well, I that's very sweet. And that concludes our salt talk. <laughs> I just want to thank everybody for tuning in. Nothing else that we have to say, Mr. Silva. Uh, but in all, all seriousness, I love these books. This is the 24th book that I've devoured. I find it to be a summer delight for me. Uh, sometimes I pace myself and savor it uh, as opposed to read it too quickly. But I can read it in a day because of uh, how great a writer you are. It's the 24th book in the series. Uh, did you ever imagine you would become a number one best-selling hero of a long series like this? Um, I, I didn't. And I think that, you know, it's, it's shocking to say this, or, but, but, you know, Gabriel was never supposed to be a, a continuing character. He was supposed to appear in one book and one book only. Um, and, you know, truth be told, when I, when I finished that book, I knew that I had created a special character. Um, but I didn't think that, that a Israeli um, could work uh, long term to be a true mass market um, um, uh, American bestseller. I thought there was too much anti-Israeli sentiment in the world and frankly, too much anti-Semitism for him to work uh, long term. And I, I was uh, talked into writing a second book uh, by a very um, uh, astute and well-regarded uh, figure in publishing, and um, it sold more than the previous book. Um, it seems difficult to imagine now, but when I first made the first notes on The Confessor, 
which is sort of one of the classics in the, in the series. Uh, Gabriel was not supposed to be in that book. And, and I was told by my, my publishers and editor, he must be in that book. Uh, it is his book. And that is, was, was the case. And so when I finished The Confessor, I sort of felt like, okay, um, we are 21 books later. And, and no, frankly, I'm, I'm, I did not anticipate that he would ever be a, a, a number one, a repeating number one uh, New York Times bestseller. Uh, and more surprised by his success than, than the person who created him. Well, he, he's, a, he's a brilliant character, and all of us that are entrepreneurs uh, love Gabriel Alon because he is an entrepreneur. There's a can-do-ism about him. There's a creativity about him. He has a love for his country, a love of Israel, and a love for Western liberty where he'll stop at nothing to protect it. And I think that those, those things make him a hero. But there's also complexity there, Daniel, in the sense that he's, uh, he's an assassin, but he's also an art restorer. So at the same time, he's about restoration and renaissance and the rebirth, if you will. But he also recognizes that he has to simultaneously eradicate evil. Uh, explain that uh, duality, if you will. I want to, I want to, go back to something that you said um, early in the question um, that is really important. Um, and that Gabriel in the last three, four, five books has been a key figure in the defense of Western liberty. Um, Gabriel believes in the global order. Gabriel understands um, um, how remarkable it is that, that, that we have essentially had, you know, peace in Europe since 1945 with some um, uh, minor wars on, on the periphery. Um, how, as, as a survivor of the Holocaust, he knows how how incredible that is. What an achievement that is. Um, and so he has been uh, since Moscow rules, um, which is, gosh, I'm losing track of time, but about uh, 14, 15 years ago now. Um, fighting Russia. Um, and he has been, you know, sort of cast himself in that role as, of the defender of, of liberal democracy and, and taking on Putin. Um, and the duality of the character is what makes him special, obviously. Um, it, it's not that he's a magician and can take a, a beat up old painting and make it look like new again. Um, restoration is... Um, the essential element of the entire series. Takum alom, repair of the world, the obligation um, to uh, not accept the world as it is, but to make it better, um, to gather up the, the sparks that were lost of creation in, 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 um, in Jewish, Jewish theology. Um, and it's a central part of the, the story. And, and it's, it's not just about paintings, it's about um, uh, injustice, it's about people, um, he can make old cars run again. I mean, he just has this gift um, to 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 restore and repair, and that's what makes gives the series its magic. Okay, so I don't want to give away any spoilers. There's a lot. I'll of give away lots of spoilers. It's okay. There's a lot of plot twists here, and a lot of a lot of fun in the book. But tell us about the cellist. There's a woman that enters uh, Mr. Alone's life. Um, the cellist is one of the my favorite. Um, characters that I've ever created. Um, and she's one of those characters that popped from the instant she opened her mouth. Um, a little little side note, the cover art, um, that's my wife. We photographed her for the uh, for the book. That's Jamie on the cover. You're looking good, Jamie. You're looking good, I, Jamie. You know, I, don't, I don't want to get in trouble with the He Too, Me Too movement, but- Oh, no, but looking, looking good. good. <laughs> um, her name is Isabel Brenner um, and she was, trained at an early age, she's German, a uh, young German woman, uh, uh, musical prodigy, could play the piano, started playing the cello at eight, um, won a very important German competition uh, when she was 17 years old, but decided that she didn't quite have what it took to make it in, in the very difficult uh, music industry. And she's had, like many musicians, she's a, a very gifted mathematician, um, so she went to to university in London School of Economics um, and went to work um, for a German bank called Rhinebank. 
Uh, and in short order, she discovered that this this bank that she's working for is really the dirtiest bank in the world um, and that it was serving as a, in effect, a laundromat, a Russian laundromat, helping um, Russians launder ill-gotten assets uh, and, and, and hide them in the West. Um, she decides to blow the whistle um, by leaking documents to a Russian reporter. Um, and one thing leads to another. And before she knows it, uh, she's uh, fighting shoulder to shoulder with Gabriel Lon, trying to save Western democracy and ultimately democracy here in the United States. The book um, begins in, in, the, in the summer of 2019 and its effective conclusion is Inauguration Day 2021. And you, but you see, you see the future in this book. You're known for seeing around the corner. So, so tell us about catching history and understanding that. And uh, I, you know, you, you write about the insurrection. Tell, tell us what, uh, in your process of writing this, yeah. how you come up with or are able to distill what the near future is. Well, the near future that I was trying to distill was. Um, and I've, I've written about this, touched on it in, in about the last three or four books, is that Western democracy, I don't want to say hanging by a thread, but it is, it is um, a, 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 a under stress. It is, it is battered. Uh, it is in trouble. Um, and we now know um, from, some, from some great reporting, investigative reporting and, and brilliant writing from some journalists and, and authors, from the, the British government, um, that the degree to which Russian money, that Russia has used its money as a weapon uh, to weaken Western democracy. Um, and so I wanted to um, write a book that deals with um, how to counter that threat. And what, what I, when I started the novel, the, the book, um, it was set in a post-Trump, post-pandemic era. Um, I, am, I felt that, that, that President Trump would lose the election um, and that, he, that th this book would be set in a, in a Joe Biden era and that, that um, Gabriel and the new Biden administration would really take it to the Russians financially. Um, and so I was working along with the book, um, had, had most of it written. Um, on January 6th, Jamie calls me. Uh, she's at the office. Um, I'm in my office. I do not have a television in my office. She says, you, got, you need to go upstairs. Uh, I said, I'm really working. Is it important? She says, go upstairs. And I, I turn on the TV in the kitchen and our capital is overrun. Um, by supporters of the, of the, of the American president. Uh, and it became clear that, that um, Donald Trump had, had, you know, formed the mob, incited the mob, unleashed the mob. Um, and, and we had in effect an, an armed insurrection against our capital. Our capital had fallen for the first time in our, in our history. Um, and within a few days, I just realized I had to write about this in the book. It, it fits so perfectly with what I was already working on um, that I, I said to my wife, I said, look, I've got to do this. I don't know how, how to quite do it. So I uh, quickly plotted a new ending to the novel. And I started writing that at that point on about January 10th or so. And so I finished a new ending to the novel and got it done. But there, it, the, the first half of the book didn't quite match up. It was in the wrong time. Everything was out of sequence. This was set, the beginning of the book was set after the pandemic uh, and after the Trump administration. I had to back the whole thing up. Um, long story short, I spent work for about 14, 15 hours a day for weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, getting the, the book um, so that everything was, was synced up properly. Um, and it, and it was um, a, a painful process. I, I was heartbroken by what I saw that day. Um, I think that as bad as January 6th was, 
for me, the inauguration day was in many respects worse. Um, if you weren't here in Washington during that period to experience the miles and miles of fences, the 40,000 troops on the streets, the military checkpoints that Jamie had to pass through to get to the office every day, um, the um, it was it was the television cameras did not capture what it was really like here. And I can't imagine what President Trump was thinking when he took that final lap over the city in this helicopter. And he looked down on this empty, empty, locked down city. And why was it locked down? It was locked down because we were afraid that thousands of, of armed Trump supporters, Republican voters were gonna come storming across the bridges. Um, how did we get to this point? Um, well, you know. I, you listen, I, I'm obviously sad, and by all of that, it had, yeah. January 6th was actually my 57th birthday. So I was, oh, my there, my, I was sitting there in my home looking at it and uh, didn't think it was ever going to come to that, but it obviously did. Um, well, I what were your nothing. thoughts? How did you think we got well, there? You know, I, 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 I was saddened by it. I didn't see it as a uh, – wasn't surprising to me. Right. Danny, it was definitely not surprising to me, but well, I'll tell you a little, I'm going to interrupt you on one thing. We, so yeah. this is how well known it was within Washington that this was coming. OK, um, on about January 2nd or 3rd, I was talking to a Republican member of Congress. I said, when's the Reichstag fire reference to the uh, fire that burned down the German parliament and led to the enabling act in 1933. When's the Reichstag fire? And the Republican congressman said the Reichstag fire is Wednesday. And so everyone knew that this was coming, but, yeah. um, but go ahead. Well, I, I mean, I, just the fact that he would say the, he would equate it to the Reichstag fire explains to you how much danger we're in and not to go overboard on European history or German history. Is it 1924? Is it 1933? Where are we right now? We do know that a good 20 percent of the people have decided that they will are willing to disavow capitalism for whatever they fear uh, in their lives. I'm sorry, uh, democracy, I should say. Right. There's elements of uh, fearing capitalism as well. But right. uh, w w there's 20 percent of the people that want to put aside our capitalist system that has made this creation what Lincoln called the last best hope for mankind has made this one of the more beautiful stories. It's a story marred with tragedy. It's a story marred with biases and racism, of course, but it is a beautiful story of many, many different people coming together off of an idea. Uh, and what we know about our great country is that it's a work in progress. And to Gabriel Alone's point, it needs to be improved. Um, I guess there's something I wanted to ask you. It's personal, actually, because every time I read your books, I close the book and say, okay, what did I learn from Daniel Silva? First of all, it's an amazing summer read. It's a page turner. It's super exciting. Uh, I wanna yell at you at times because I wanna read this on the beach in front of the surf, but I'm not able to do that because I find myself reading at 3 a.m. in the bathroom where my wife is like, turn the light out. I say, like, yeah, I gotta get to chapter 17. Can't turn the light out. But when I close the book, what I learned here, and I want your reaction to it, is that there is a group of forces. It's almost like a sibling, sibling rivalry, Cain versus Abel. There's a group of forces that are just frankly jealous of the United States. At the end of the day, they couldn't put it together. They couldn't put it together. Uh, they feared it. Uh, we know that we have great benefits from our decentralization and our checks and balances. There are countries that are autocracies that would actually never release that kind of power, even though uh, what we know about power, the axiomatic fact about power is when we give it away, we become more powerful. That's the uh, axiomatic irony of it. And I guess what I learned from your book is that we seem to have lost our edge. It's either our complacency. Or we've had hundreds of years now of vaccines. So people now believe that uh, there's no need for them anymore. But We've gotten to this point of health as a result of these vaccines. Uh, the same thing with the democracy. Uh, we got here as a result of all these virtues. And I guess what I'm wondering uh, when I close this book, how do you restore it? How do you become the Gabriel alone of the American democracy and the movement of the West as it relates to individual freedom? You know, it's just... Um 
uh, it's not just in this in the, our country. Um, France, for example, um, is its democracy is under great stress right now. We had the Yellow Vest movement. Um, we have the remote possibility, but I, maybe not so remote possibility that they could elect uh, Marine Le Pen to be their president. Um, their 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 parties are in, in complete disarray. Um, British democracy is 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 struggling. Um, look, we had in the United States, but coming back to us, um, we just got walloped by a succession of big, big unexpected events. Um, 9-11, kaboom. Um, Iraq war did not go as planned. Um, a crippling uh, uh, financial crisis that we uh, eventually recovered from, but the recovery was uneven. And I would say that it exacerbated some trends that were out there in, uh, in the workforce. Globalization um, and, and frankly, the changing demographics of our country. These are huge, huge developments. Um, and we have a, a significant portion of the, of the, of the population um, that has been that has, is not succeeding in this new economy, uh, this new reality, um, and the um, I, I guess I I come back to though that the demographic changes are 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 I th they th they seem to have come upon us more quickly. And when you look back at the, the, sh the Hispanic share of the electorate in 1996, for example, this minis was minuscule. Um, and and uh, it happened so quickly. We became uh, much more multiculturally uh, uh, diverse um, more quickly, I think, than, than people imagine that would happen. And these are enormous pressures. And these are big, big um, things that we've got to deal with. But I'm, I am most concerned in the, in the short run about the number of people uh, who identify as Republican or Republican leaning who no longer believe in democracy um, and who are willing, who's, who are, at least they say they're willing to use violence to achieve their political ends. This is what I find alarming in the short term. Um, I find the prospect of even a Trump candidacy in 2024 um, to be almost um, uh, too frightening to, to, to contemplate because I think it will ultimately lead to uh, pre-election violence, post-election violence, a contested election. I mean, we got, we got, we got the ship to shore uh, in, in, in 2021, but it was a close, it was a close call. Oh, you know, it's Gabriel just, said that Pat power was transferred, but it was not peaceful. It yeah. was not peaceful for the first time ever. Yeah, so no I'm, I don't want to sound like um, chicken little or Debbie downer here, but I'm a, I'm, I'm a little nervous. I'm a little nervous. Well, listen, I respect that, but I would add to that. It's not just him. I mean, he's got acolytes that want to be him. They, they view themselves as smarter versions of him. Uh, and uh, th th he has given them a playbook. Uh, and of course, through voter suppression and through different types of laws uh, and just the gerrymandering process. Remember, these Republicans are now controlling a large swath of the state legislatures. Um, they're very confident that they can take back the Senate. I'm sorry, take back the House, even though they may not have the popularity to do so. They, they know that they may be able to segment the districts in a way that will allow them to do that. Let me, let yeah, me change. Is, this. It, is, it, is there, um, uh, they have the, the ability of Trump to mobilize sort of the um, darker elements of our, of our society. Yeah, I mean, that's question. one thing that he did that was just, um, they really bottom fed for votes um, that we used to joke that it, it became a joke in Washington that white supremacists were, were, were actually a core part of his constituency, but it's true. Um, it was true. Um, and, and white nationalists and Christian nationalists, that was that was the the the, the, the core of Trump's appeal. 
Um, and well, I mean, listen, look, look, I think that I think that um, I hope that that they don't go down this road. I'm try, trying to choose my words carefully of trying to get in a situation where they use maximalist power at the state level in the Congress to try to force a candidate through and pick and and, and um, overrule the will, will of the voters and make what them what make a Republican president um, because it will destroy the country. There will be violence in the streets. Um, I mean, imagine what would have happened if Trump had actually won a narrow electoral victory in the last election, losing the popular vote by seven million votes. I mean, would the country have been governable under those circumstances? I mean, yes, constitutionally. Um, so we, we've got some, we have some, there's gonna be some dangerous, tricky months and years here coming up. Whether whether we whether we make it, um, it uh, whether our democracy survives, and by the way, our divisions are real. Obviously, I don't know. I need to explain that to you. Our divisions are real, but the fans have been uh, the flames have been fanned at every step of the way for years and years and years now by by Russian information operations and Russian propaganda. Um, and the, I invite you to read. The, the Russia report that the British government released last summer, um, that the extent to which Russian money had rotted their, their uh, political institutions and financial institutions, and it was all planned, it wasn't by accident. And I think I think that's a point that you make in the book, and that's one that I have with great sadness. And so the Russians weren't able to build a, a great fluid system. They weren't be able, able to build a multi-tribal uh, democracy, so a result of which they set upon destroying the United Kingdom, France, and the United States. And so these active right. measures were perpetrated against people that weren't necessarily their adversaries, but they figured, okay, you know, it's a race to the bottom. If we're hitting bottom, we would like to drag down these other it's, countries. It's, it's, and, 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 you know, I was um, having dinner with an ambassador from a, a country that I can't identify uh, the other night. Um, and this is a, a authoritarian country that is under pressure to democratize. And the ambassador was telling me what a gift January 6th was to this, like to be able to hold this up to, to uh, their people and say, this is what democracy looks like. Do you really want this? Um, January 6th was a, I mean, Vladimir Putin must have just loved it. Um, all the authoritarians in the world loved it um, because it showed our, our system to be in disarray, at least on that day. Um, we pulled through, uh, but we did enormous damage to our democracy and enormous damage um, to our reputation around the world. And I will tell you here, here in Washington, talking to diplomats from various countries, they don't, ex they're not, they're not optimistic about our future. I mean, um, the Europeans are glad to have us back but they're very wary that the whole thing could swing back again or that, that, or that we might actually slide off a cliff and not be a democratic country anymore. Well, I, mean, um, I, would say that, I would say that even our closest allies are, are not betting on us right now. I, you know, listen, I, I agree with that. Obviously, uh, spending more time in the business realm than politics at this moment. Mm -hmm. But I look at somebody like Liz Cheney. I look yeah. at somebody like Adam Kissinger. Or kissing your however you pronounce his name, and I mm -hmm. say, okay, well, at least they have levels of principle. Uh, I think it's somebody like Lindsey Graham, who I did have a relationship with, who I'm not sure what happened to him. I, I mean, maybe there a new book, and it could be a, a nonfiction book. Where is Lindsey Graham? Because <laughs> I can't, I don't know where he is. It's like, where's Waldo? It's just a representation of what he once was. Um, and what, what I would say to you that has me uh, alarmed is Lindsey Graham said Trump plus. He wants Trump plus. That means he wants to dig into more of that fear mongering and he wants to dig into more of that hatred and more of that division to hold power as opposed to freshen up the party, break down and rebuild that party and go after a more beautiful mosaic of people uh, with better ideas. Yeah. And so I, I, I'm, I'm at a loss to understand that. Um, but I want to I explain I wanna, it. They, they wanna, can't. Their, their, their electorate won't. Their base will not let them tack to the center in order to build that beautiful mosaic. 
Um, just ask Speaker Eric Cantor about that. I mean, he wanted to do an immigration deal and he's in leadership and he got primary gone. Um, they're just not interested in it. I mean, any any party that had not has not been able to carry a popular vote at one time since since 1988, one time. That party, you know, should tack to the center where all the votes are, but they're actually going farther and farther and farther and farther. Um, and getting back to your previous point, the only way that out here with this shrinking base and out here to the edge is through the only way they're going to get back into power is with voter suppression and, and um, sort of maximalist constitutional means to try to get to get back in. That's what worries me. But I, I interrupted. I'm sorry. No, no, not at all. I, and I have to turn it over here to my millennial, John Darcy, so that we get our fantastic uh -huh. ratings, uh, Daniel. But before I do that, let's play Desert Island Discs for a second. You have, you've got uh, music abounds in this book. And so abounds. what are your favorites? Let's go to classical jazz and rock and roll. Tell us what your favorites are. And also, what is your all time favorite? What was the first song you remember? Oh, the first song I remember? Um, you know, I, I, was spent the, I spent the, uh, the first you know, years happy. of my childhood in, um, in Michigan. Um, uh, Wikipedia says that I was born in Detroit. That's not the case. I was actually born in Kalamazoo. Um, so I love, love, love Motown music. I love, love Motown music. Those are the first songs that I really remember. Um, okay, so we do some some classical. This is this is impossible it's assignment to pick. You know, one um, thing to listen to on, on a desert island. But people ask me, like, you know, I don't know anything about classical music. What should I start with? What should I listen to? If I were to be trapped forever with only you know one thing to listen to, I would take the five. Uh, uh, Violin, excuse me, a piano concertos of Beethoven. Um, I have piles and piles and piles of different versions. Um, these are some classics, um, but, but Beethoven's piano concertos is where I would, if I had to pick one. And what about um, jazz? Well, I mean, I'm a, I'm a bit of a jazz fiend and everyone faces this dilemma. What's your favorite? What's your favorite? And I think that most of us come back to Kind of Blue by Miles Davis. I mean, it's just regarded as the, the, the greatest jazz album ever recorded. And I, I, I agree with that. I'm going to put a, a second one. I'm going to cheat a little bit. I was just listening to it the other night and I'm so saddened uh, by Keith Jarrett's um, health problems. I love, love, love my song by Keith Jarrett. I just think it's just one of my favorite records. Um, I'm going to transition to rock and roll by going to a, a jazz rock album, totally essential, but uh, Steely Dan's Asia. Oh, I love that, um, the Deacon Blues. Uh, oh, yeah, I've got a album. really great, great, great. Uh, We're dating ourselves, Silva. We're dating uh, ourselves. No, and then if I had to pick one, I, this is one I, I love. I, this, I love the song Peg. I love Deacon Blues. Oh, there you go, the boss. Yeah, and then for the, my favorite rock and roll album of all time is. Darkness on the Edge Down, my first yeah. it's, a, it's a gritty, gritty album. I love that album as well. Of course, Darcy has no idea what we're talking about. That's fine, John. <laughs> Let us live in the moment of our past glory, or as Bruce Springsteen would say, glory days. Uh, before right. I turn it over to Darcy, what about Sinatra, though? What about Sinatra? Sinatra. I love Sinatra. Um, um, live at the Sands. I, I just... I, listen to that record all the time. Particularly um, his, uh, his breakout into conversation. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Those are <laughs> exactly the He's stories. In the the, of <laughs> you know, some, of, some of the stuff that's on that album wouldn't pass muster today, but um, um, I just, I just, I love Frank Sinatra. So John, what would you like to ask uh, the award-winning, best-selling novelist, by the way, I, before I get there, though, I have to thank you for the acknowledgement. Of course, you've now, you've now, uh, you know, I've got Boris and all the other undercover mobsters following me around, but it was a brilliant uh, uh, acknowledgement. So I'm sending you a hug over the uh, over the phone lines here. Well, I, I I I meant it though because I was I was working through 
you know, what is the goal of this operation? How am I going to take this person down? Am I going to do it criminally or am I just going to do it as an, in, in effect, what I did here is a name and shame type operation. And you and I pulled it apart and, and, and. The only way you can uh, do it, Daniel, that was my point in terms of our conversations, you know. Uh, yeah. Otherwise you have to th- throw the bankers in jail. Right. Um, and so we, we, um, uh, I, that, that conversation with you was, I, I meant it was pivotal, pivotal in helping me um, uh, decide what the operation was going to be, what the goal of the operation was going to be, what the mechanics of the operation are going to be. Mr. Dorsey. Well, I will have to confess, we did some investigative journalism or spy work in the spirit of Gabrielle Alon uh, and have some other questions for you. One about your music. So uh, we investigated and found that you used to go to punk concerts back in the day. Uh, what type of attire did you wear to those punk concerts? Um, you know, my my punk attire was um, more of the... Um, the suit jacket uh, with with uh, over a t shirt with jeans. I was kind of that kind of punk. I, I was not no 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 crazy makeup. No uh, no uh, no piercings. None of that stuff. I was kind of a kind of a um, dressed up punk. Right. Um, I actually I actually a little bragging. I, I saw the first American performance of the Clash actually, um, and was living in in. Uh, uh, the Bay Area, we had a vital uh, new wave music scene. And I got to see a lot of, of great acts back then. So going back to the book, uh, you, know, you talked about Rhine Bank is the bank that you, that you mentioned in the cellist. Uh, <laughs> did you draw any real life inspiration from, you know, maybe was Germany a, a random selection in terms of the, the home of the bank that you mentioned? And how much is dirty foreign money, which is a big theme in the book, how much is it flowing into the United States and poisoning our democracy. How uh, influential is this campaign uh, by forces, you know, especially emanating from Russia, uh, from, from a monetary perspective? Um, well, the first part of the question first, um, as I point out in the author's note, um, you know, I did draw from the, the, the sins of a certain um, uh, Frankfurt-based bank um, and applied them to my fictitious Rhine Bank. Um, and, you know, I was talking to someone, a very important figure in the financial world um, who helped me with the book. And he described that that bank as a rogue bank. Um, and that when he called that uh, bank a rogue bank, it stuck in my mind. And I ended up calling my bank Rhine Bank. Um, um, and so, yeah, I mean, Deutsche Bank's um, many, many sins are are um legendary at this point um and and, and it's it's um past uh, uh uh behavior and conduct uh certainly helped help me create um uh my bank um the the truth is um you know i don't think we really have a grasp on on um on how much money has made its way into the United States. I mean, I'm, I assume that Vladimir Putin owns property and, and shares of companies in the United States through intermediaries and cutouts. Um, um, I'm not sure uh, if Anthony would agree with me, but I think he probably does. Um, people who launder money like the United States and Great Britain, because we have this enormous financial depth. I mean, there's just a lot of stuff out there. Uh, to hide your money in, uh, particularly in, in real estate. Uh, we allow anonymous purchases. Um, we have people in the financial industry who are willing to soil their hands with this kinds of money. Uh, and I, and um, Miami and, and all much of Florida are ground zero for this kind of activity. Um, a lot of it is criminal and more and more and more of it are uh, kleptocrats. I mean, right. we have we have we have kleptocratic regimes around the world um, that are stealing money that they should be spending on their people, um, and that money, um, almost in, in most cases and nearly all cases, has to be removed from the country that they are ruling and stashed someplace. Um, and it ultimately, I think, it, it, it much of it finds its way here. Um, with, when the British released their when the British released their report, um, 
what you know a lot of the commentary at that time was you know that the British did a better job at at dis dissecting the impact of money on their democracy and on their financial system, dirty Russian money that we haven't really quite um, um, gotten there yet. We haven't gotten our act together on um, figuring out how, you know exactly how much money damage is being done by by money on our political system. Right. I think if you look at the Trump campaign is in a microcosm in 2016, you can see that money and the promise of money and the promise of Russian riches was how they wormed their way into that campaign. Um, uh, Paul Manafort was completely compromised by Russian money. Uh, he was in debt to Russians. He earned millions from Russians and was in debt to Russians. Um, you know, it's, it's a recipe for disaster. And, and it's a pure coincidence that uh, Trump, no other banking institution would lend to him, except for Deutsche Bank. You talked about Florida being ground zero. There were some, uh, let's call them sketchy real estate transactions involving Russian oligarchs and Donald Trump. And also we, we've discovered that Russian uh, interests were laundering money through the NRA. So all things uh, you know, very relevant that, that you cover sort of parallel tracks in your book. Um, but but moving away from the Russian angle a little bit, again, mm -hmm. a part, part of our spy journey, uh, talking about your writing process. Um, you write a book every year. So it really means you have about six months to write. That's not a lot of time. And you pack amazing stories, amazing amounts of research into that time. What's it like in your house when you're on deadline? And what's your process? Do you sit down at your laptop and just type out ideas? Or what does that process look like? Um, the process is, um, and I just went through it a couple of weeks ago. Um, and the process is I want to be able to see about 100 pages of a novel in my head. Um, and that's what when I can see 100 pages or so, I start working on it. I don't necessarily have any clue as to how it's going to end. But just if I have a clear enough vision to get going on something, I'm not like Raymond Chandler starting with a sentence or something like that. But um, I don't outline in detail. Um, and I will tell you that that I'm you know I'm going through it right now that 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 already that the the hundred pages that I started with in my head you know two or three weeks ago it doesn't really look much like that um, um, and so you know I really work on my books sentence to sentence paragraph to paragraph scene to scene and. Um, I get to work nice and slowly for a while in, in the in the summertime and 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 September and October. But boy, about, about Thanksgiving, I'm starting to get a little anxious because I've got a <laughs> deadline coming up. Um, after New Year, it's 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 full on sprinting for the deadline, and so I you know I I I, I decided to give myself you know uh, another thing this year by throwing out my book. Uh, I threw out my ending. I wrote a whole new ending. So it, it um, you know, the last months of it are pretty awful. Right. And you, your wife tells you. us that she, she sometimes hears laughter coming from your writing room. <laughs> Is that something where you get, you know, into the characters, you feel that they're real and you're, you're experiencing that story with them? Yeah. They, they, um, if, if they, when it's really, really working, okay, when the magic is really, really happening, I'm just writing down what these characters are saying to one another. When I'm really in the moment, when I've really created a scene and put two familiar characters talking to one another, I'm just eaves eavesdropping on them. And I know that sounds crazy. And, and Anthony right now is, is calling a medical professional. <laughs> uh, I, can, I can see him in the other shot. But when it's really working, I feel like I'm just just eavesdropping on a scene that's going on inside my head. Um, I'm actually, and sometimes they will I'm say actually things deflated that, for the rest of the summer because I can only read this once without knowing everything. <laughs> so I'm, you, you've left me uh, in pain uh, for another 364 days, Daniel. Uh, but, you know, the humor does find its way into the novel, I think, um, the, the novels, I should say, um, of its own accord. I, I don't necessarily... Um, try to make things funny. Um, but one of the things that I discovered in hanging around with the, around with Israeli intelligence officers is that they're, so, they're funny guys. Um, they have, are very, very smart, 
very worldly, incredibly dark, uh, wonderful senses of humor. Um, and, and Gabriel has that, 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 uh, that side to his character. Um, um, he, he's quietly, um, darkly funny. Right. And the uh, last question I have before we let you go, there's a theme throughout all your books. It's a Hebrew phrase called tikkun olam. It means repair yeah. of the world. Talks yeah. about uh, what, what Anthony sort of mentioned earlier. Why is this yeah. idea of repairing the world so important to you and so important to Gabrielle Alain? Um, well, gosh, try, try to imagine the world that brought, that, that turned, I mean, Gabriel should have been born in Berlin. His name should have been, um, his name should have been Frankel. Um, he should have been living in Berlin, becoming a, he'd be a, a famous German artist, uh, Gabriel Frankel. Um, and things didn't work out that way um, because in 1933, Germany's democracy fell to pieces. Um, they elected a madman. Uh, the world blew up into, into war. Um, six million Jews, at least, were, were murdered. Um, he ends up being born in, in Israel with a new name um, and into a totally different circumstances than the circumstances that he should have been born into. Um, and so why wouldn't you want to repair the world? Why wouldn't you want to make the world a better place? Um, and we can all do that um, in our daily lives. We can just the smallest gestures, um, we can, we can um, make the world a better place. Um, and unfortunately right now, um, there's a, a nihilism that's loose in the world. Um, I would say that, you know, what, what is, what is Russia's foreign policy? It's nihilism. Um, they don't believe in anything except raw power, the exercise of raw power. Um, and, um, we have enormous challenges facing us right now. Um, and I think if getting back to our, the broader point of this discussion, if democracy is going to succeed and Joe Biden has said this many, many times, it's got to, prove itself that it can work. And by that, it can, it can help people make their daily lives a little better. If we can help that, that woman who's working two jobs, if we can help her care for her children, um, that's a little bit of tikkun olam. If we can help people make their lives a little better so that they might have a little bit of an extra time and a little bit of extra money to be the best that they can be. Um, that is that is what I think we should be striving for right now. And I think it will take the steam out of this ugly, awful, uh, I hate the word populism because I don't think it accurately describes what's going on right now. Right. Um, um, to take the steam out of this, this, um, this thing that's out there loose in our country right now. Right. Well, Daniel, it's always a pleasure to have you on. Your books are fantastic. Anthony, hold it up one more time before we go. I'm holding, I'm holding up the front and the back. I also, uh, for all of you people there that just want to be green with envy, I have a signed one. Yeah. Just get to that page before we allow the author to leave. So I was super excited about that. Uh, and so I want to appreciate. I want to appreciate you in a way that. Let's uh, see the signed one though. I saw it. I saw it on social media. Yeah, I put it up. There it is. I just want to thank you for that. Four sixty nine. Four sixty nine. You're a uh, you're a sensational writer, Daniel. But uh, in addition to that, you're uh, you're telling us through stories uh, what is really going on and what we all need to contemplate and think about. And so, for those reasons, it's an entertaining book. It's a page turner. It's suspenseful, but it's also a brilliant exposi exposition of our zeit current zeitgeist. So, thank you for writing it, and I'm looking forward to the next one. And you're going to break the record here, Silva. You're going to be on salt almost as many times as me. John Darcy's going to let you come back. I hope so. It's my favorite. I just love doing this with you guys. I really appreciate uh, the fact that you had me back um, because it's just um, well, the just a wonderful conversation. And I love you guys. And, and I really appreciate it. Thank you, Daniel. Feeling is mutual. And uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in to today's Salt Talk with Daniel Silva, the fantastic author. Uh, we highly recommend, if you haven't read all of the Gabriel Alon series, as well as uh, his other three books, that you go out and read them. Great summer reads, as Anthony mentioned. You'll, you'll pour through them. Uh, but just a reminder, if you missed any part of this talk or any of our previous Salt Talks, 
You can access them on our website at salt.org backslash talks or on our YouTube channel, which is called Salt Two. We're also on social media. Twitter is where we're most active at Salt Conference. We're also on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. And please spread the word about these Salt Talks again. If somebody's looking for a great summer read, uh, they've come to the right place. Pick up one of of, uh, Daniel's books. But on behalf of Anthony and the entire Salt team, this is John Darcy signing off from Salt Talks for today. We hope to see you back here again soon. 